evening coming live to you from no i'm not going to tell you where i am but my name is max sue hill tonight our speakers will focus on addressing mental health issues that impact on various life stages stress management hypertension strokes and how this is all interrelated in addition the speakers will share some practical ways to manage or cope with these issues we will have q a at the end check this out drop your questions in the chat box, okay? That's how we're gonna do it. And if you want to learn more, we have educational videos on the Garden State Church website. Check it out, check it out, okay? I'm not gonna say anything else. Let's get into this. Let me introduce our speakers for tonight. Dr. Kara Gill, known as Mackie outside her professional life, is a medical doctor who attended medical school, residency, and fellowship in New Jersey. Great things happen in New Jersey. I mean, we all know that, right? Where she became a disciple of Jesus Christ as a medical student. She lives with her family and practices primarily adult medicine. Dr. Gill will provide an overview on how hypertension and stroke are interrelated to mental health issues. She will highlight the impacts, risk factors, and share some practicals to mitigate. Our next speaker, Kalita Kibbelin. We all know Kalita. If you don't know Khalid, you about to know him today, okay? He is a certified crisis counselor and peer support specialist for Crisis Text Line since 2019. He also volunteers as a disaster response crisis counselor for New Jersey Division of Mental Health Services. Carlito will touch on mental health across life stages. I'm not going to say anything else. I will not turn it over to Dr. Gill to kick us up. Good evening. Can you guys hear me? Okay, great. Thanks, Maxu. All right, so today I'm going to do a brief overview talking about the interrelationship between mental health, hypertension, and stroke. Uh, May is Hypertension Month, May is Mental Health Month, and so the Health Empowerment Group decided to focus on both of them, but primarily giving the full attention tonight on mental health. And I'm just going to provide a little snippet because we spent some time in the past talking a lot about hypertension and stroke. So I just want you guys to understand that hypertension, diabetes, uh, heart disease, stroke, they have all been shown to have a high incidence of depression. And they can affect the treatment and, and the prognosis and the outcome of a person who has these uh, pathologies, these diseases, and who have depression. They've shown that there's an increased prevalence of high blood pressure in people who are depressed. And then on the flip side, there is an increased prevalence of depression in people who have hypertension. So here you see this interconnection that we have between these diseases. And depression has been shown to negatively impact the course of hypertension. And basically the medications that you can give a person to address some of the depression symptoms have been shown to interfere with the blood pressure control. And as some of the blood pressure medications that we gave you to control high blood pressure have been shown to affect uh, some issues uh, with your, uh, uh, your depression. And so it's important for us to understand that these things work together and we need to stay in close communication with our providers. Also, uncontrolled high blood pressure, as we have told, talked about before, can lead to a stroke. And we've seen that strokes have, patients who have strokes have increased depression. Um, the rate of post-stroke depression is really up to about 33% in the population in the United States. Uh, and what is important to understand is that people who have post-stroke depression have a high mortality. That means they have poor recovery, they have a, a poor outcome, higher, higher levels of death, and um, a lower quality of life. So it's very important for us to understand post-stroke depression, to understand this thing can happen. If a person has a stroke, they are at increased risk for depression. So the good news about all of this is that hypertension and stroke that have depression, the treatment plan involves medication, lifestyle changes, 
But what I thought was very, very fascinating in the literature, it talks about how it's important to improve the patient's psychosocial function. So yes, where the relationships come in. It, it really talks about how people who have a healthy psychosocial life uh, increase the psychological and the social function, address loneliness, can really help improve the outcomes. And that really was exciting for me to read that in literature. And we know the risk factors, we talked about that. What are the risk factors of hypertension? We talk about physical inactivity, we talk about unhealthy diets, we talk about being overweight, uh, being obese, we talk about high blood cholesterol, um, high fat in your blood, diabetes, um, insufficient sleep. That's something that people don't realize, but insufficient sleep can also impact and put you at risk for high blood pressure, sleep apnea, and psychological stress. So with all of that information, I want us to really, really pay attention to what Carlito is going to talk to us about. Because this is important. Not only is mental health important for us to function, but we have to understand how it impacts us physically uh, and how our physical response, our physical being is very connected to our mental health, our emotional health, and our psychosocial well-being. So with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague and friend and buddy, Kalito. Thank you so much for this time. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dr. Carol Gill. Uh, Mackie, thank you. Uh, I really want to first, by, uh, by virtue of what she spoke about, tell you that I suffer with bipolar depression. I take Losartan every day. Uh, I think it's about, uh, I can't remember how many milligrams it is. It's pretty much what I need. Uh, and I do check my blood pressure every day. I'm at the 130s range on the high number. On the bottom, it's about 90-ish. Not good enough. Um, uh, I tell you this because you, you've probably heard me before talk as a crisis counselor, talk giving mental health um, advocacy, talk with uh, sort of the mental health uh, stabilization, destigmatization. I need to manage myself every day because I go through as much stress as you do, maybe as much, if not less, more, whatever, whatever the range is. Uh, I definitely need to manage myself and I can even share and I will get to, into sharing this. Uh, some of my past, which was probably worse mental health. So I'm trying the best I can to manage what I need to manage, but everything that Mackie's saying, I so appreciate what she just described because I do want to kind of dig in and kind of pop the hood. It being May Mental Health Month, I mean, let's give a shout out for our Garden State Church and May Mental Health Month. It's been awesome. I'm, sh I'm sharing my screen uh, right now. You probably see it, right? And, um, you know, it's the end of the month, but I just want to review real quick. We started out the month with, how about Chuck? You know, our elder Chuck giving us an awesome intro into the month, talking about, and, and this is just my notes, just obviously I remember a lot of things from it, but not only him describing how early intervention into access to mental health is huge. It really is huge, right? I mean, I really didn't get treated on some of the things I need to get treated in, until 2013, which is about 11 years ago. I can say I probably suffered with some depression in my early onset and sort of my suspicions I had was in college. I actually took a year off from depression and took a full year off from college in, uh, you know, um, I won't say the year. <laughs> anyway, so Chuck gave us a great uh, introduction into May Mental Health Month. But think about this. We go through, we talk throughout the month about serving one another. What a great skill that is to serve one another out of our own genuine hearts, right? Last Sunday, when uh, Ashton and Nikki McGaney talked about some mental health and mindfulness, I picked up some notes on, I don't know about you, but Nikki mentioned grounding techniques, meditation. You know, Ashton talked a little bit about journaling, um, serving, which with a caveat, he did it exactly the way he, he described it. You know, with a caveat, serving is great, but as, a, you know, as a coping skill, we got to be careful that we're not burnt out into serving. Because in some respects, I feel like serving does help my mental health huge, huge way. Uh, and then lastly, I'll say this, and, and this is a good shout out. I think, Russ, you'll like this. But the one another way that we kicked off in May or late April, um, that is a coping skill. It really is. Trust me, because 
uh, the men's mental health support group that I I've started in 2019. Gosh, I, I need them Sunday nights. There's some Sundays when we don't do it. Like for example, more Day weekend, obviously for obvious reasons, we don't do it. But, you know, I get some texts like, hey, are we still doing right? Or I have some emails, people kind of logging in still on the Zoom. And it's, it's just like, well, you know, we need some time off at least for ourselves. But I'm so glad that I have them right there because th th that's a group that I can at any one point, they could say it too. If you reach out to each one of them, they'll say, I could text somebody. And in a moment, it's kind of like a 911 text. They can pick up the phone and we could talk. It's a one another thing, right? We're supporting each other. The safe group. Um, you know, that, um, uh, that, that, that's run in, in our, our Garden State Church too. And then the peer mental, the, the peer support mental health coaching team that, that uh, Chuck set up, uh, that's, that's really something that I think as a Garden State Church, we're going to do wonders with how we treat mental health. So with that, uh, you know, it's not just, it, really, I want to say it's nothing new. Mental health is not new. It's been around since the brain started, all right? Mental health has been around so long. It's maybe how we approach mental health could be new, right? I remember when I was a very young Christian, I remember a gentleman by the name of Mike Leatherhood, uh, Leatherwood, and when I listened to him, I heard him preach. I was like, wow, that really makes sense of the kind of concepts he's he's um, you know employing here and describing. And it made sense for me in, in, in getting in touch with scripture and sort of like the caring mother nature of God and Jesus as this mental health caring ministry. So it's nothing new mental health. It's just maybe how we deliver and how we do it. Um, the campus, campus, I'm looking at a screen because I'm just looking at somebody knows. Campus, you guys have been talking about mental health for a while. Like I remember 2022, we were, we were talking, we were having these mental health talks, 2022 and 2023. Edge, singles, Brooklyn. I was just in Brooklyn last week. They invited me to go over there. Um, you know, they have a team already in place and they're talking about mental health. They wanted me to go speak. And so, you know, I crashed it sort of, you know, but I, I was like, you know, I'll just be the smaller part. I want to listen to more of you guys. The teaching ministry in the Garden State Church. You know, we had this piece on Holy Spirit and mental health. I remember that. That was really cool. So today as Health Empowerment Group, not only do we want to help empower, but we do want to make sure we make light on what mental health is and as it relates to um, scripture. So I wanna give you some, let me get actually back out of this real quick. Uh, I do wanna kind of back out real quick and show you um, some data, right? But before I do that, I wanna to go to articles. Articles that was actually sent to me. Articles that you can, I'll have this in a reference and I'll send out to you. Um, we'll get it out to you. Sherry can send that out to you. Um, the headline says there are 19% of US adults Report frequently or always feeling lonely. New Yahoo, YouGov polled finds. Here's why and which age group is affected most. So this is just recent, May 20, 2024, okay? Um, I want to scroll down just quickly to a chart, right? We're visual learners, but this is something that you can extrapolate and just for yourself. When I read this, I kind of, I make some assumptions. I make some sort of notes for myself. And I try to relate it with my walk and what I see out there and who I'm helping or or whatever, right? So these are from this poll, some of the answers they gave already, not you know, well, you know, which of these issues do you struggle with most, if any question mark, right? Uh, not living close to loved ones, not having enough time to socialize, difficulty making friends, not having a romantic relationship, right? So you can read the other two. You know, this bigger piece chart of this or the pie of this chart. I like to say it's kind of the miscellaneous category, right? So they just none above, but let's just go in order. 13%, which of these issues uh, do you struggle with most? 13% uh, said not living close to loved ones. Okay, it's intuitive. That makes sense, right? 12%, um, not having a romantic relationship cause you as far as these issues that you struggle with in terms of loneliness, right? And then 11%, well, then the 11% of your difficulty making friends, that kind of makes sense. But here's an interesting thing. Response is of 11% for those spending too much time online. Now, I, for me, my sort of reaction to that is, um, well, okay, <laughs> I spent a lot of time online, but can I connect with people online, right? Isn't that a way to connect with people, right? Isn't there chat, Facebook, and isn't there Instagram? You know, I'm maybe outdating myself. Maybe there's other stuff going on out there that you guys use that I don't use TikTok, or whatever. You know, there's ways to stay connected. But um, if it's a struggle and if it's something that they're saying, you know, they struggle with the most, there's reasons why, right? Um, I, I can only 
I can't speak for other people, obviously. We all can't speak for each other. So I'm going to speak in an I statement to speak for myself. All right. There are times that before I go on social media, I have to pray. <laughs> you know, so I, I sort of have to be careful where my mind is at. I have to be careful with where my emotions at. Right. So let's say, for example, <clears throat> let's just take it in my work environment. If I'm on LinkedIn and I'm going in and before I go in, if I don't consciously take uh, stock of where I am emotionally, I could run into trouble. How? Well, you know, I could feel like, well, hey, the startup business that I'm doing with a friend of mine, we're growing, we're doing what well. we did excellent last year, 141%. You know, all these things that I could, you know, we're hitting our goals, we're, we're outpacing our goals last year, blah, 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 right? I could list it all off, right? Yet, when I go on social media, I could feel like a failure. I could feel like a failure looking at other companies being successful, okay? And I actually talk about this in therapy. I actually bring this up. And my therapist is great about reminding me like, you know what, you can only control yourself and we go through a lot of other things, but I have to talk about this because it, you, if we spend time on social media and we're not careful, it can cause issues in our lives, right? Uh, how about this article? And again, I'm going to give these references out there at the end of the, the presentation. It'll be in a format. Americans are increasingly concerned about their mental health, survey says. Here's how social media plays a role. And I'm kind of equipping you guys, right? I'm kind of actually doing an exercise right now um, we like to call in the mental health field, self-awareness, probably the best skill you can ever develop for yourself, a self-awareness. How, why, what? Just look around you. What's going on? Take stock of what's going on around you. Take stock of yourself. I just kind of want to put on, like responded, cited these issues as drivers of anxiety, okay? Uncertainty about the future, 51%. Current events, 49%. Body, image, physical appearance, 35%. Okay. So my intuition and sort of my, what I extrapolate from that is I agree. <laughs> I agree with a lot of that stuff. Fear scares me, right? Fear of the unknown. Um, uncertainty is fear. Current events. If I'm not careful, if I get trapped into getting sucked in online, too much news, whatever, being careful where the news is coming from, or let's just talk about rumors or gossip or stuff like that within my own social circles being careful of what's happening or image, right? Image. I, I struggle so much when I work out because I wish I could work out more. And, you know, yeah, I don't want to go into that, but it's just, it. we all have struggles of what we consider our own, in our mind, what our standard should be, right? Now, here's an interesting thing. I want to kind of bring this up. In the article, it says, health provided, uh, CVS Health, Fortune Wealth, this article, talks about with additional data showing 81% of respondents ages 18 through 35, okay? So 18 to 34, that range is really 80% of the responses kind of, you know, leaned into this, this survey. And that helps me out. Here's a self-awareness thing. Take 18 away. It's 2024, 18 years ago, 2020, 2006, right? I did math, right? 2006, 2006, okay? 18 year olds, year olds who were born back then. So 2007, that's a big year. Does anybody, anybody have an idea? It's just kind of rhetorical, but 2007 was kind of a big year because this validates what I heard on the, um, on the uh, NPR or uh, sort of an, an NPR radio news station on, on mental health where they were tracking stats of the generation, teen generation, 18 to 34. And this was actually a radio um, interview that I heard years ago, but they started tracking stats on suicide and mental health and depression, anxiety. They started in 2007. That was an important year, 2007. Why was that an important year? Because that's the year the iPhone was created. OK, the iPhone started the the smartphone craze. Right. And we all have a smartphone. So it's tied to social media. It's tied to anxiety. It's tied to fear. It's tied to constant attention and sort of like over attention in certain areas. Right. So if you know, if if Dr. Mackey explained a lot of what the physical results are, and I do feel that myself, we know kind of what's going on around us. Have we ever thought to just stop and just look around and take stock? 
Because if you do that, and it's called journaling. If you actually do that on your own in a skill where you can kind of journal and just kind of being aware you're in your quiet time doing things like this, you can kind of get to some solutions, right? So here's some more data. I'll put it this in slideshow mode in a second here. Here's some, so here's some data. One in five adults have a diagnosable mental health condition. One in 20 have a more serious condition. 52% of employees report feeling burned out in the past year because of their job. 83% of employees agree mental health and well-being training is or would be important in creating a positive workplace culture. Now, all this comes from NAMI uh, or you know, National Alliance of Mental Illness and uh, you know, just some recent sort of research. Um, again, taking stock, understanding what's going on out there. Um, there's some, like, I would kind of say to you, when I deal with a lot of heavy emotions, there's some elements I have to go into to just kind of understand what's going on out there. And, and, and sometimes knowing thy enemy is important. Meaning this, we talk about this in men, men's mental health support group is, you know, besides what you're feeling and besides what you're going through, you may say like, yeah, I'm upset. I'm angry. I'm you know, I'm this. Well, how about digging in a little further and actually describing what these feelings are? And this is kind of something I got personally from my own. Um, this is kind of a, another skill set where I took from some of my treatment uh, outpatient program, um, you know, even in coping skills, coping kits. They talk about this in mental health support, having a coping kit. This is one of the, the um, images of a snapshot of what I got from my treatment center. I took this and put it in my phone as part of my coping coping skill and understanding what it is I'm going through. Let me just get to, you know, inventory on what I'm feeling. So instead of me just feeling angry, how about like I can describe to my wife or the person I'm having an argument with, you know what, can I describe to you that instead of me just saying I'm angry and I'm irrational or I'm just getting in a fit of rage here, I feel misunderstood. That's a better feeling. I just want to tell you, I'm feeling misunderstood. We're having a discussion, an argument, whatever. And I just feel like as much as I'm describing details, you're kind of shutting down. Why? Maybe it's because my emotions, I'm angry. But let me backtrack and talk to you about, I just feel misunderstood. Okay. That's a softer landing place. Then I'm just angry. I'm really upset at you. And here's how it's going to go down, right? So that's kind of some of the things we do talk about in our support group, but also out there in healthcare, they talk about these things. They say, know thy enemy, describe what you're going through. Maybe uh, it will help sort of frame up what your mind is. And now you can start to kind of describe everything. And while you're doing that, while you're describing, the emotions are now being grounded and sort of fizzling off. You know, there is, uh, I remember from Ashton on Sunday, he talked about, you know, the FOMO, FOMO, right? So the fear of missing out. And here's a side anecdote I want to give to you that, that in the fear of missing out for me this year, the biggest FOMO I felt I had to sort of um, lean into and engage and meet head on was the solar eclipse day. Okay. And here's why, because I am originally from Maine. I graduated University of Vermont, uh, some of the most like pro predominant years of my life growing up, adolescent, young adult were in those states. Guess where the solar eclipse charged through on the path of totality of 100%, Maine and Vermont. Guess where I was during the time of the solar eclipse? Hoboken, New Jersey. Okay. So, uh, and mine for, you know, just kind of describing sort of how I had to kind of engage this and talk through this because it was frustrating was I could not leave New Jersey because of work. All right. I had planned out the solar eclipse day six months prior. I knew that my parents live or have property in Maine. My, my, I have so many friends in Vermont, of course, the University of Vermont, I can go there. Burlington had a front row seat, you know, David Muir and, and ABC News. I watched it live struggling. You know? <laughs> and then my brother who traveled oh, about a couple hours and saw, you know, he saw the, uh, the solar eclipse. He was, he was like, it was an amazing event, just like one of those lifetime events, right? So I, I, I say to you that it was challenging for me to, to have that moment come and, and go, but here's how I engage and here's how I leaned in and I'll show you a picture of it is I said to myself, I am where I am and where I need to be. 
God allowed this to happen. So let me not hunker down at home and not be around anyone and isolate. I need one another. Okay. So I went out there and I went to Stevens University. I went to a community. I engaged. Oh, wait a second. What happened there? Um, I engaged in a community. And there you go. There's some photos of my day on Solar Day. Even though it was on paper 75% totality, I felt like, you know what? Let me take my dog. Let me take a walk. Let's go see this solar eclipse day, even though we're not only going to get 75%. Yeah, there was a community there. These guys were great. I was laughing with them. We were all kind of chatting. We were, everyone was engaged. We're like, this is a unique event. Wherever I am, I wanted to see men. I'm here living in New York, in the New York area. This is where I live now. I don't make my residence in Maine anymore or New Jersey, uh, sorry, uh, Vermont. I am in the Garden State. This is my home. So I decided like, yes, this is where I am. I'm going to lean in. And it was a great experience. And here's how I had to journal this. So this is a journaling skill. I had to just hunker down and say to myself, all right, God, what do I need to learn out of this? Well, it's quite, it's, this is factual. You guys need to do this too. We need to be factual about this. I am a disciple. I I would love to study the Bible with people. I'm not studying the Bible with people right now, but if I were, it would be, it's a great feeling, right? So I do have one another relationships. We do talk about eternal things. Just imagine disciples, you guys, you guys kind of like, just kind of lean into this and own this and, and be proud of yourselves. We help people change their lives for eternity. The solar eclipse is around once every, I don't know how many hundred years or whatever, and it lasts for three minutes. That's it. Okay, so that's what we got to kind of wear on our badge of shield, our fuel of faith, and say it and remind ourselves every day, like, we make more of an impact than the solar eclipse. We do. Okay, so that's how I attacked it. That's how I went after it. And let me tell you, I had to go to therapy and talk about that. And some of the things came out. So that's sort of my FOMO event to tell you that I do struggle with it also. Now, let me get back into some of this slideshow. And I do want to take it through and, and to the end on this slideshow. And I'm going to put it in slideshow format because I think you'll like this. So here we go. Um, it looks like you're looking at data. And we looked at that, right? So let's go to the next page. John 16, 33. If we ever need to ground ourselves with scripture, and if you're ever feeling, say, lonely in the world, or you're ever feeling sort of you're struggling with any of those negative feelings, go back to Jesus. John 16, 33 says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace, and in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. You know, the TPT version, which was, again, impressed upon me by Russ, I like looking at that, also to accompany all of my other versions. And everything I've taught you is so that the peace which is in me will be in you and will give you great confidence, right? This is colorful. As you rest in me, for in this unbelieving world, you will experience trouble and sorrows, but you must be courageous, for I have conquered the world. Now, how do I match that up with also those feelings of loneliness and, and you know, feelings of just, hey, um, exclusion, FOMO, whatever, uh, you know, how do I, how do I turn? How do I mindful change, right? How do I metanoia? Well, hey, in six prior chapters recorded by John, it says the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. A thief has only one thing in mind. He wants to steal, slaughter, and destroy, but I have come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect life in its fullness until you overflow. So, my metanoia and, and my sort of suggestion to you is, what is life to the full? Ask you, this is kind of the, the part of the wise mind that you'll get into. And here's what I want to suggest. Life is sort of like, could it be full of hard knocks, adversity, hardships? Yes. Joy, peace, and happiness? Yes. Um, life is full of, which one would I rather have, hard knocks or number two? You'd rather have number two. But let's be real, like we're all mature disciples. Life isn't just all joy, peace. And how about blessings? Sounds great, right? Yeah, life full of blessings. You know, great job, great, you know, I have great property, you know, all those blessings. No, 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 no. Let's look and remind and ground ourselves what Jesus says are blessings, right? So blessings are blessed are the poor in spirit. Uh, blessed are those who mourn, for they may be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Uh, I want to kind of get down. Blessed, I want to get down to this one, verse nine. Blessed are the peacemakers. This takes work. 
peacemakers. It takes work to be at peace with people. So if we're thinking like, I like to have a life full of, you know, just joy, peace, and happiness, it's not going to happen according to what Jesus said. We're going to have that life that's going to be uh, lots of struggles and trouble, but it's going to take work for you to actually make your life full of the blessings, but the blessings, let's just be grounded, the blessings that Jesus says that comes to you in Matthew 5. You know, metanoia is about mind change. Like, how do I change my mindset in a fallen and hurting world, right? So expand on that. Ask those questions a little more. These are the questions I had. You know, how do I survive then in this world of trouble and hurt? How, how do, you know, do I just exist? You know, how do I live, right? I think a lot of you, you'd prefer, you'd rather live than exist, right? You'd rather live, live, live life to the full, right? You don't want to just kind of be around and just exist like a robot. So how do I move through and not just get through? My suggestion submission to you is probably going to be this. It's going to be some sort of wise mind. And wise mind is a skill. It's a skill they teach in mental health. It's a skill that is of the school of Marshall Linehan of DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy, as opposed to cognitive behavioral therapy. And this is where I think disciples, we can live right here in the middle, in the wise mind area, because we all have a rational mind. We all know what that is. We all have an emotional mind, right? But DBT puts into play, really, it fuses the both both of them, it acknowledges that we are emotional people. We are created with emotions, but we also know we have personalities and we are capable in our mind to ground ourselves logically. So wise mind captures kind of both of it and puts it sort of in a proper order, if you will. And then there's a metanoia. There is a mind change. Okay. So if you put wisdom in the, uh, sorry, the dictionary, this is what spits out. Quality of having experience, knowledge, and good judgment, the quality of being wise. If you put biblical wisdom in your phone app, just put it in the uh, U version phone app, this is the first thing that spits out according to this version I had. And it's a lot of scripture that, again, you can, as James once says, if you, you lack the wisdom, well, what do you do? You pray to God, ask for it, right? Um, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight. Um, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction, all right? The last one, the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Um, you know, when I was with the college kids a couple of years ago, they asked about like, well, wisdom, you know, how do you get it? And how, you know, my only answer to them was, unfortunately, you're going to have to learn mistakes to get wisdom. Yeah, there's no sort of box you can open up and there it is. Wisdom just came out and I can now put it in my pocket and go home. You actually going to have to, and you know, in crisis counseling, we know people go through crisis issues. We try our goals to get them to the calm. You know, from my experience as a crisis counselor, I sort of bake in crises. I do. I bake in crises in my life. It's going to happen. Jesus, you know, we just read what Jesus said in John 16. So if I can bake that in, the quicker I am to cope, the quicker I am to mind change, right? The quicker I am to ground myself. Now the wise mind can become more colorful. This comes from the wellnesssociety.org. There's really kind of two organizations I subscribe to and to get all my DBT and wise mind and all my learnings. And well, wellness society is one of them. So again, I'm gonna give this slide, slide deck to you guys. But you know, reasonable mind, feeling cut off or numb to your emotions, avoid or being in denial about something that's happening. I'm just reading a few of these. Emotional mind, behaving impulsively, acting on urges, reacting quickly, wanting to, wanting to hurt who hurt you, wow. I just read that for the first time. That's me. That's me prior to my 2013. I so wanted to hurt people after they hurt me. Um, in fact, I was in therapy uh, last week talking about, um, you know, where I'm now going through some things like EMDR with her and, and I'm just kind of accessing areas where I, I can I can identify my past where I'm a very open person. I'm very cordial. I'm very like, I'll let people in, but the danger I have is when that happens and people will fail me. I want to hurt them back. I want to get back at them. So the wise mind has to come in. It has to come into play. I have to ground myself. I have to see the situation from multiple perspectives and to continue on in a healthier way. And it starts with the mind. 
practical scriptures. These are some of the things that Chuck and I have kind of sent out there to you guys. It's there again, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4 through 5. The one I really kind of hone in on and I've learned from group therapy is verse 5. We take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Sorry. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That is a skill, pinning down these racing thoughts, these ruminating thoughts, these looping thoughts, pinning it down. There are skills to do that. Uh, but again, you can read Proverbs, wisdom scriptures. He was slow to anger, has great understanding, and profits from his self-control. Learn the truth. Never reject it. Get wisdom. There's that word again. Self-control and understanding. In other words, the practicals that I kind of sum up for myself, again, for what I've learned and for how I'm going day to day is baking in the crises. And when they happen, I'm patient to react. I got to slow down. Let me ground myself. Let me take stock, inventory. What's going on here? Coping skill. Act like an attorney. Fact find. Start to look for the silver lining. Like that whole FOMO thing with uh, um, you know, the solar eclipse day. It really took a while for me to get the silver lining on, but I had to kind of hunker down and kind of figure that out. Ask for wisdom or as Paul did revelation. In other words, pray. I want to say this. What they teach in um, treatment, outpatient, whether it's partial hospitalization, one-on-one -on -one talk therapy, psychologist, whatever. They actually teach that one skill that you can employ is calling to a higher power. Kid you not. That is one skill they teach you. We have the advantage as disciples. We're taking care of each other and we know this. We look at Paul. When he was in trouble, he got on his knees, right? I sort of have conversations with folks uh, and when it gets deeper and deeper into levels where they just kind of, you know, how do I do this? How do, you know, I need help. I tell them, you know, honestly, right now it's praying. We got to get on our knees. We call to a higher power. We got to channel. We got to access that, right? People who do not have God in their life, who are not disciples, they don't know where to go. When they hear that in treatment, they're like, what the heck is that? So I'm just going to go on and do other things, you know, maybe pick up drugs on the side, you know, coping skill, that kind of stuff. So that's something that we have an advantage of. Lastly, and I'll end on this, a couple more slides. So it's probably just two more minutes. But how about that one another relationship, right? How about that one another relationship, not only with the fellowship brother, sister, not only the fellowship significant other, whatever. Not, how about that one another relationship with God? This is the area I'm trying to explore more for myself. Why? Because it, it tells me in the Bible, it says, by, you know, God is in my thoughts, right? In blameless heart, willing mind, for the Lord searches all hearts and mind, understands every intent and inclination of thought, okay? So there are times I see someone post something on Facebook, it's kind of nasty. I kind of, you know, I know so, like a spiritual person, I kind of message them directly. I says, you know, what did you, what, what are you trying to do? There's startup of, you know, argument, whatever. Oh, how dare you, what? Now, let's just look at this scripture. Never heard a thing from him again. He was quiet. <laughs> you know, because really God is listening to you before you send, send. Make sure you understand, like, God, should I do this? Send this? You know, TPT version, Psalm 42, 1, 2. I long to drink of you, oh God, to drink deeply from the streams of pleasure flowing from your presence. My longing overwhelm me for more of you. My soul thirsts, pants, and longs for the living God. I want to come and see the face of God. I believe this is our deeper, um, you know, theme scripture for the men's retreat in September. But there is a relationship going on with God that we all have. I'm trying to get into this mindset that I do feel like I'm still trying to meet God. Like, do you guys get that? I get that. I sort of walk away from challenging relationships. Like, I had one in my family where I had to kind of put boundary on the person be like, you know, I can't contact you anymore, which is very toxic, right? But what I understood from that was, you know, that's not God. That's not Jesus. I can't wait to meet Jesus, you know? And I feel like in the world today, I'm going to meet somebody who's close to that Jesus, right? I have to. That's faithful, right? Disciples, right? But in the world, there are people who are very toxic. I kind of, when I walk away with all the bruises and the you know, the pain and sort of the, you know, the, um, you know, the scarlet letter on me that's just like scarred me or whatever. I walk away and say, well, you know, that wasn't Jesus, but I'm still trying to meet Jesus. That's what's great in faith. I'm still chasing this person. He gets us. Do you guys see this out there? He gets us. There's this ad going on. But, and if you dig into he gets us, I love just how they're, they're saying us. He gets us. He's inclusive of everyone. Who's he? Jesus. You know, if you ever want to know my story, uh, NAMI asked me to write 
my testimonial when they started a blog in 2021, I think it was. And when they reached out to me, I said, sure, I, I'll give you a full testimonial on how I went from patient to survivor. You want to go to NAMI, go to the blog, go to, uh, you know, category archives, just put in Carlito, you'll find from patient to survivor. You'll know why I'm still a crisis counselor today. And I believe wholeheartedly no one ever should be paid to be a crisis counselor. It's just genuine. It's the work of Jesus. Lastly, um, I kind of want to end with this. Uh, I love this. It, it speaks a lot to when I felt like I was marginalized when I went through. I went through 11 years ago. I wasn't in Garden State Church. I was in another ministry. When I went through what I went through, I felt so marginalized. I felt so like no one understood me. Just, you know, my mental health, what I was going through, hospitalized two or three times, just it was a struggle. And I do kind of relate now more with Jesus when, you know, I, I tell some of the guys in my group, I'm like, read the Psalms, read the scriptures, like painful David, right? Imagine the millions of eyes and hearts who've read that scripture by David and they all sunk and they're like, I can believe, it, right? You're not alone. You're not alone. And how cool is it that Jesus he says, I know the feeling, like you fill in the blanks, you fill in the blanks. That's our leader. Everything is about mental health. And he was the first to put mind and heart, body, soul, and mind. So these are my references. I'll send out to you. I'm going to end it there and uh, give it back to uh, Maxu and stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Dr. Gil and Carlito, oh my goodness, this was powerful in bold, in caps, all of the above. So I think now I'll turn it over to Russ because uh, this concludes the service, but we're going to stay on a little if you are you know, interest, interested in staying on, Russ. <laughs> yes. Well, again, let's thank all of our um, our speakers, uh, our experts, and uh, appreciate so much your, your knowledge and, and sharing with us um, the, the things that we discussed tonight. Carlito, you know, that wasn't just openness, that was, that was vulnerable. And it, there's a big difference with that, my brother. And you, you did a phenomenal job. Dr. Gill, thank you for uh, as well, teaching us and, and helping us understand just the importance of our health. And the thing I love about the Health Empowerment Group is you're helping us with our whole self. We're not just talking about our spirituality. We're not just talking about quiet times and whatnot and discipline, but it's, it's the whole self. And again, I'm so grateful to be a part of the Garden State. And uh, thank you so much for the practicals the direction that we receive uh, because, you know, ultimately you pointed us back to Jesus. That is the, the beauty of uh, what we get to have here. And so again, let's give it up for our health empowerment group. You are making a difference in uh, our church here and uh, now going over and helping with Brooklyn. And, and I know some other ministries I've had uh, Chuck and, and Carlito come and uh, I, hey, <laughs> I want to be known as that church that helps the whole person, you know, the whole person. So as Maxu said, at this time, we're going to end uh, our service, but we are going to have a Q&A time. And so if you have some questions that you would like to address uh, to our professionals, you can put them in the chat and then uh, we will uh, answer them as, um, as we come up. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to say a closing prayer, and then I'm going to turn it back over to Max Sue, and uh, we'll continue with our Q&A. So let's uh, bow our heads and let's pray together. Father, first off, we want to thank you for, for just even the idea of uh, having a health empowerment group. Thank you for putting it on the hearts of the professionals uh, here in, in, in the Garden State Church, and that they get to use their talents. They, they get to do something uh, that, they, that they do all the time, and um, I'm sure are tired, and, and yet came on here tonight and continue to give. Uh, again, I appreciate that heart and example, and to see the way 
that the body can be built up. I do pray, Father, that, that we uh, are just as concerned with the inside stuff as we are with the outside stuff. And so please help us remember uh, your, your promises. Help us remember um, that, uh, you know, you are uh, Lord God Almighty. And uh, I pray that you help us continue to deepen our one another ways, God. It is so clear um, the world is hurting um, and, and, and we're hurting in, at, at times and, and that uh, we can fight loneliness. We can fight uh, the different things uh, that we may think uh, about ourselves or about others. Uh, and it's, it's great to know we're not alone and that no temptation uh, that has seized us is uncommon to man and that you are faithful and that you won't allow us to be tempted beyond what we can bear, but you will provide a way out. Help us seek that way and help us in doing so seek you uh, because what you started in us, you tell us that you will bring to completion. And so help us to surrender our lives to you each day because uh, your way is better than our way. We love you and we pray all this in your son Jesus name. Amen. 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 I will turn it back over. Thank you, Russ. All right. Thank you.